In the next 15 to 20 minutes, we will discuss ultrasound evaluation of pelvic emergencies. Pelvic pain is a common complaint in females presenting to the emergency department. Accurate and rapid diagnosis is crucial for management. Ultrasound is the main modality to diagnose various conditions in these patients. The advantages of ultrasound, as you all know, are that it's non-invasive, it's readily available, and we can assess vascularity, which is important in lesions such as torsion. Uh, the abdominal ultras the pelvic ultrasound will usually start with a transabdominal pelvic ultrasound with a full bladder using the bladder as an acoustic window. It'll also help to screen other abnormalities such as renal pathologies, bladder pathologies, and because pelvic pain uh, is a presenting symptoms for other pathologies such as acute appendicitis, it is also useful to evaluate that. Once we are done with the transabdominal exam, we usually prefer we proceed to the transvaginal exam, which gives us better evaluation of uh, the pelvic structures. If you haven't spent a lot of time uh, scanning transvaginal ultrasounds, I would suggest uh, during your ultrasound scanning rotation, uh, scan a few patients so that you get oriented uh, well towards the anatomy on the transvaginal ultrasound. So if you imagine the, tr the transducer, sorry, the transducer is in the vagina and you're looking at the uh, uterus. So imagine your sagittal section on the CT and you're looking towards the uterus uh, through the vagina. So that will give you some orientation. Common pathologies. The most important pathology uh, in the pelvis that presents as an emergency is ectopic pregnancy. It's about 6 to 16 percent, uh, seen in about 6 to 16 percent of pregnancies, uh, who pa pregnant patients who present with pain or bleeding. Uh, the most important thing that it's the leading cause of maternal death in the first trimester. So it's a very important diagnosis, uh, especially it is important to diagnose this before uh, they rupture. So when they are smaller in size, they are unruptured, they can be managed with uh, medical termination of pregnancy. The risk factors uh, include tubular abnormalities, prior pregnancy complications, and prior ectopics. Uh, the most common site for uh, ectopics is going to be a tubal pregnancy. Uh, and ovarian abdominal uh, pregnancies are very, very rare. So almost like until proven otherwise, a ectopic pregnancy presenting to ER would be a tubal, is going to be a tubal pregnancy. Uh, so let's look at the imaging findings. On transabdominal ultrasound, you may see a complex adnexal mass uh, and free fluid in the hepatorenal space. This is important because when you see this, that means that there's obviously rupture uh, and this means that there is significant free fluid. So by the time fluid accumulates in the hepatorenal space, that means that there is a large amount of fluid. Now, there are various findings that have been described on uh, ultrasound for ectopic pregnancies. The most important finding is absence of an intrauterine gestational sac uh, and finding an adnexal mass in a pregnant, uh, in a patient who's uh, pregnant. So if the patient has either a beta HCG or uh, a urine pregnancy test, if you don't see anything in the uterus, uh, the main differential that you should be worried about are is an ectopic pregnancy, although this can be very early in the pregnancy. So that's another differential you have to keep in mind. So uh, along with an absent intrauterine gestational sac, the other thing that you look for is an adnexal mass separate from the ovary. So let's look at this. Uh, Cine clip from a recent case that we did. Uh, so there is this adnexal mass uh, separate from the left ovary. So let's it loop. So that's the left ovary anteriorly, and there is this mass here which is heterogeneous and separate from the ovary. Also noted is uh, I would say moderate pelvic free fluid, free fluid with low level internal echoes, which suggests hemoperitoneum. So this was a case of a ruptured left ovarian uh, ectopic 
left adnexal ectopic pregnancy. So adnexal mass separate from the ovary, tubal ring sign. There are a couple of signs described, but they may not be seen in all cases. So the tubal ring sign is an echogenic rim surrounding an unruptured ectopic pregnancy. And uh, finally, free fluid in the pelvis with low level internal echoes suggests rupture. When you see this on the transvaginal abdominal, transvaginal ultrasound, make sure that uh, you go back and look at the hepatorenal space to rule out any free fluid in that region because that would mean that there is significant bleeding. A subtype of ectopic pregnancy is what is an interstitial pregnancy. So if you imagine this as the uterus, uh, so this end of the, so these are the tubes. So this end is known as the interstitial end. So an ectopic pregnancy at the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube uh, would be an interstitial ectopic pregnancy. It's again very, very rare. Uh, it has a higher morbidity and mortality as compared to other ectopic pregnancies. And diagnosis is often very challenging. The one thing that has been described, one sign that has been described is uh, lack of more than five millimeter myometrium uh, surrounding the gestational sac. Again, uh, it's not a very sure short sign. Another sign is an interstitial line sign where there is a thin echogenic line uh, extending from the ectopic pregnancy to the endometrium. So that's the endometrium, that's the ectopic pregnancy. So this thin line is known as the interstitial sign. Again, not very, uh, um, not seen very commonly. One thing that you note is lack of at least five millimeter around the end of, uh, around the myometrium. And even in this case, diagnosis can be very challenging. Uh, you suggest follow up because I've seen in a few cases that when there is very little myometrium, uh, the sac is eccentric. Despite that, uh, what happens is that these continue as normal pregnancy. So very challenging diagnosis. The next important thing that uh, you should be able to diagnose is an adnexal torsion. So common presenting symptom would be sudden, severe, unilateral pain. In younger patients, the ovarian, uh, the, mob the ovaries are mobile. So uh, torsion is relatively common in the younger patient. In elderly patient, uh, they, when torsion occurs, it's commonly associated with masses. These can be cysts. Uh, dermoid cysts would be one of the more common pathologies that can cause this. Very rarely, it can be secondary to enlarged ovaries or ovarian hyperstimulation. About 50 to 90% of cases have masses. An interesting fact is that endometriomas and malignancies, they cause tethering of the ovaries to adjacent structures, and they are very rarely associated with torsion. Another important point to notice that ovarian malignancies commonly, uh, they won't present with sudden severe pain until... Uh, uh, they'll usually present with metastatic disease. So if you have a patient with ovarian malignancy presenting with sudden severe pain, think of a differential of torsion. Another fact uh, about torsion is that uh, the right side is more common than the left because the sigmoid colon on the left has a protective effect on the uh, left ovary, so it doesn't dart that often. Let's look at this case. So this was a uh, young female presenting with left-sided uh, pelvic pain. Look at the ovary, it's enlarged. Uh, so the common findings that you look for are enlarged ovaries and uh, findings suggesting ovarian edema. We'll discuss that in the next slide. So look at this enlarged ovary and on Doppler, there is hardly any flow. Uh, in a patient with sudden onset severe unilateral pain, there should be a top differential. So this is a cine loop of the same case. The findings in adnexial torsion are related to enlarged edematous ovaries. Uh, so size more than five centimeters. So ovaries are usually three to four centimeters in size in most patients. So if you see a ovary, an ovary that's more than five centimeter without a focal lesion, uh, this is one of the most sensitive sites. Another thing that you look for is unusual position of the ovary. So usually the ovary would be uh, on one side. If the ovary is displaced to the midline or sometimes even on the opposite sides, it's bulky, then uh, that would suggest torsion. Whirlpool sign is twisting of the ovarian pedicle. 
again, it's a bit challenging to visualize on ultrasound just because um, the adnexal vessels are not well visualized. Uh, this finding you can use even on CT. So for example, if you're looking at a CT, you see a large ovary, trace the adnexal vessels and see if there is any twisting. Now findings related to ovarian edema. So string of pearl sign is when the ovary is enlarged uh, and edematous, the follicles are displaced towards the periphery. So if this is the ovary, uh, the follicles would be displaced peripherally. Uh, so that is known as string of pearl sign. Note that this appearance can also be seen in polycystic ovaries, which are also bulky. So that is a pitfall for this case. Follicular ring sign is an interesting sign that has been described and I've seen it in a lot of cases with ovarian torsion, including the one that I've shown here. So this cine loop, look at the ovary, it's enlarged and look at the follicles there. Maybe I can go back to the previous slide. So look at this follicle here. So normally uh, the ovary, ovarian follicles do not have any walls. They do not have perceptible walls. Uh, but in torsion, what happens is that there's edema. So uh, there's sometimes edema, there's hemorrhage. So uh, you see this echogenic rim around the ovarian follicles that is known as the follicular ring sign. And it's fairly specific for torsion. So uh, along with enlarged size, look out for these signs. Another important caveat is that uh, presence of blood flow or ap presence of blood flow does not rule out torsion. Uh, so the ovaries have dual blood supply, dual arterial blood supply, uh, one from the adnexal branches and the other from the uterine arteries. In the initial phase, especially, uh, the arteries will be spared uh, and then you'll, there'll be lack of venous flow. So whenever you're documenting uh, a pelvic ultrasound uh, like ovaries for torsion, make sure that the technician documents arterial and venous waveforms. So what's the role of Doppler? So Doppler will help you uh, to look for the whirlpool sign. It'll be better seen on Doppler images. And secondly, it will, uh, it will help you, uh, it'll tell you the viability. So for example, if there is presence of venous flow is associated with uh, viability. So if they go back, go in, go into the OR and uh, detour the ovary, the chances of viability are higher when there is persistent venous flow. So that's the role of Doppler. Uh, and again, uh, it can be tricky. For example, this case, uh, recently, uh, this young patient presented uh, to us, uh, we saw this large mass uh, in the left at Nexa and we saw the ovary separate from it. So we said that there is a mass uh, in the left ovary and the left, left adnexa and the left ovary is seen separate from this. Now, interestingly, like the patient went on to get an MR. So interestingly, what this was, this was a large torsed ovary uh, and this was the normal ovary. So this large torsed ovary was displaced to the midline simulating an adnexal mass and this was the normal right ovary which was sitting besides it. So remember large size, uh, displaced ovaries and uh, uh, not very well seen but even this patient had multiple follicles with the nicogenic rim with the follicular ring sign. So this is the MR for the patient and even on the MR you see that uh, ring around the follicles. This is a post contrast subtraction image and there's hardly any enhancement in this ovary. So this was a case of torsion. Ovarian cysts, they're very common especially in the younger age groups and they are often asymptomatic. They'll present with symptoms uh, when they are large, uh, when they undergo hemorrhage or when they rupture. Common appearances for hemorrhagic cysts would be this lacy net or spider web appearance. Uh, when the clot starts retracting, uh, you'll see fluid debris. And then finally, there'll be no flow. Th these are signs of a hemorrhagic cyst. When uh, you see crenulated margins and complex free fluid adjacent to it, that would suggest a ruptured cyst. Uh, a common pathology uh, that you may see in younger patients is what is known as middle schmerz. So basically, uh, ovulation can cause uh, e these patients symptoms. Uh, that's a German term, I guess, for ovulation. Uh, so that's another, not very common, but once in a while, ovulation. Uh, so in that patient, in those patients, you'll also see a dominant follicle with crenulated margins. 
let's look at this case. So this patient uh, presented with lower abdominal pain, a pelvic ultrasound was performed. Uh, what you see here is uh, this patient had bilateral cysts. I'm showing you the left ovarian cyst and then complex uh, echogenic area around the left ovary. So this didn't look like normal fat. So that's the reason why uh, we suspected that this is probably hemorrhage. This was the CT that was subsequently performed, which shows large hemoperitoneum. This was a case of ruptured ovarian cyst. Pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, again, fairly common pathology uh, in younger patients, but uh, on imaging, it may be occult, especially in the initial phases. Very rarely, you may see dilated tubes, so hydrosalphings, biosalphings, and tubo ovarian abscess. Uh, this is a nice case where we saw uh, dilated tubes with thickened walls, so this was biosalphings. A few days later, this ruptured and the patient had peritonitis. So again, not seen early in the early on imaging, but later on when they have a tubo ovarian abscess or hydrosalphings, biosalphings, you may be able to pick that up. Uh, endometrial findings are again challenging. Very rarely you may see endometrial fluid, collections or gas. Malpositioned IUCDs. Uh, IUCDs, uh, most cases, uh, they will be well positioned. About 10% of cases, they can be malpositioned. Uh, they can cause pain, bleeding, or very rarely perforation. So the newer IUCDs, they are made of pliable materials. So very rarely, you will see them perforate. Even on imaging, if you see that, if you don't see the limbs really well, and you see that the limbs are uh, indenting the myometrium, uh, try to use the term indenting and not perforating because these are most of these are made of pliable materials like plastic. So there are very low chances of them perforating into the myometrium. Uh, findings on ultrasound. So normally uh, the vertical limb should be about five to five to six millimeters from top of the fundal endometrium. So if this is the uterus, that's the endometrium. Uh, so let's say this is the endometrium. Uh, so the top of the IUCD should be approximately five to six millimeter from top of the fundal endometrium. So that's the normal position. So if you look at this case, uh, the IUCD is not appropriately positioned. Uh, in this patient, we thought that one limb was going inferiorly towards the endocervix, the other limb was going cranially. Uh, we don't see that nice T-shaped configuration that you would want to uh, look for in a normal IUCD. If you don't see an IUCD, either the patient has expelled it, uh, but if the patient is confident that they have not uh, expulsed it, uh, then the possibility of perforation and uterine rupture should be considered. And a radiograph, uh, to begin with, we, we should do a radiograph to localize the IUCD. And if we find it outside the uterine cavity, CT would be next step. Chronic conditions such as fibroids and endometriomas uh, very rarely can also present with acute symptoms. Uh, and just because how common they are, like these are one of the most common pathologies that you're going to see in the pelvis, uh, you should not forget these. Rare pathologies would include ovarian vein thrombosis, seen most commonly in the post uh, postpartum period. Ultrasound is difficult uh, just because we don't see the adnexal vessels that well. Uh, let's look at this case. This was diagnosed on CT. The right ovarian vein is dilated and shows a filling defect. Now, retrospectively, this patient had this patient had a pelvic ultrasound, and retrospectively, if you look at this cord-like structure uh, in the right adnexa, this probably represents the thrombosed right ovarian vein. So although challenging, uh, this is something that you can look for, uh, especially if the patient is presenting in the postpartum period. Ovarian hyperstimulation. Uh, this is usually seen in patients undergoing IVF. Uh, both ovaries would be massively enlarged, more than 12 centimeters, uh, and there'll be free fluid in the abdomen, bilateral blue effusions. Uh, let's look at the CT case. I didn't have uh, I don't have an ultrasound case for this, so this is uh, from this article uh, from Eurodad.org. 
which shows enlarged ovaries. Uh, this is a CT case which I had uh, diagnosed previously. Uh, look at the left ovary, how bulky it is, uh, and then there's free fluid. So those are signs of ovarian hyperstimulation. And finally, uh, we did talk about a lot of pelvic pathologies, but remember, more common pathologies like UVJ calculi, lower ureteric calculi, and acute appendicitis can also present with pelvic pain. And that's the reason why whenever we do an ultrasound, uh, we usually also scan the kidneys. And in most patients, if the symptoms are right-sided, the clinicians will also ask for a lower quadrant, right lower quadrant ultrasound for appendix. Take home points. So if you look uh, if you see an enlarged edematous displaced ovary uh, with impaired flow, think of torsion. In a pregnant patient, either with positive UPT or positive beta HCG, if you don't see an intrauterine gestational sac and you see an adnexal mass separate from the ovary, think of ectopic pregnancies. Uh, complex pelvic free fluid, so free fluid with internal echoes would suggest hemorrhage, uh, so that would be a varicine finding. Ovarian cyst rupture is a common cause of pelvic pain. It is important to distinguish tubo ovarian abscesses from other pelvic abscesses. Say, for example, a ruptured uh, appendix or a complicated diverticulitis, they can also have similar findings. So in case where you're not sure, you don't see the ovary separate from the abscess, it's always a good idea to suggest CT for localization. If you don't see an IUCD uh, and the patient is a uh, patient does not have any history of expulsion, uh, make sure you get pelvic radiographs to confirm that it's not ruptured. And finally, in patients with on IVF, uh, if you see bulky ovaries, think of ovarian hyperstimulation. These are my references. Thank you. You can follow me on Twitter and all other social media platforms at Radiogan for more radiology content.